Hi everybody! Government intervention in labour markets is often based on the grounds of equity, i.e. that free labour markets can end in unequal distributions of income and wealth and in poverty. So when governments intervene in labour markets, they do so to redistribute income and wealth and to reduce poverty. In this video, we're going to look at all the policies available to governments to help redistribute income and wealth, but also looking at the counter-arguments the arguments against some of these policies before finishing with key evaluation points to this big debate. Don't forget that income and wealth are mutually reinforcing concepts. So with high income, you expect high wealth, the two come together. With high wealth, you expect high income, the two come together, as covered in my previous video. So all of these policies uh, can be argued to help redistribute income and wealth. So a key thing to take away right now is that government intervention here is a normative consideration based on equity, based on fairness or unfair outcomes that free labour markets can bring. So let's start by looking at taxation policies to redistribute income and wealth to help reduce poverty. There are two options available to governments. One option is to make progressive income tax systems more progressive, either by taxing the rich more heavily, i.e. by raising tax rates on those who are earning in the highest income tax brackets, or by raising the income tax-free allowance at the lower end. By raising the tax-free allowance, it's the poor that are going to benefit the most because they're able now to keep most of the income that they're earning, or more of the income that they're earning. But by raising tax rates on the rich, the idea is the government will collect more income tax revenue from the rich, and that revenue can be used to redistribute and provide to the poor, either in terms of higher benefits, or by spending on key areas of the economy like education services, health services, which will benefit the poor significantly. At the same time, the government can actually reduce regressive taxes. Regressive taxes, we know, uh, take up a greater proportion of the income of the poor than they do of the rich, i.e. they burden the poor more than they do uh, than the rich. So examples of regressive taxes are things like cigarette duty, alcohol duty, fuel duty, but maybe most significantly VAT, very regressive. So by reducing these taxes, we are reducing the burden on the poor we are increasing the amount of income that the poor can keep and then spend to increase their living standards. But let's now look at some of the issues with these. By making progressive income tax systems more progressive, by specifically raising tax rates on the rich, Laffer would argue that you're distorting incentives and the overall tax take for the government might be less. The amount of tax revenue collected might be less. Why? Because if you're rich, the incentive to earn more income reduces. The incentive to become more productive, to take on more risks, to become entrepreneurial, to make more money, disappears, knowing that most of that income is going to be taxed away. So the overall impact will actually be less rev revenue collected by the government. Laffer argues that if the government taxes too much at the high end, this is likely to be the result, resulting in lower tax revenue collection for the government. Watch my video on the Laffer curve to really understand that in more detail. The link is just above me. The argument against reducing regressive taxes is the hit to government finances, especially when now in major developed economies, regressive taxes are big earners for the government. And if the government takes a big fiscal hit, who knows what, might, what that might mean for the future. It might mean austerity policies going forward to help control government budgets. Other policies that can be used involve increasing benefits or transfer payments. Transfer payments are payments made by the government to economic agents where there is no exchange of goods and services at all. So raising benefits, of course, can help to redistribute income. You're helping the poor significantly. Benefits uh, that could be increased could be means-tested benefits or universal benefits. Mean-tested benefits are benefits simply to those who desperately need it, only to those people, and they get taken away when living conditions improve or incomes increase beyond a certain threshold. So means-tested benefits include things like uh, the working tax credit in the UK, but also unemployment benefit, maybe the most famous example. Whereas universal benefits don't get taken away when conditions change or improve, and they're available to all, regardless of whether they're in desperate need of them or not. So a good example of a universal benefit is child support, for example. So by increasing benefits, it's clear how we can redistribute income and wealth. Uh, we increase um, the incomes of the poor, especially if we consider mean-tested benefits. But, what are some of the problems of this? Well, by increasing mean-tested benefits, the risk of a poverty trap is quite significant here. If you are on means-tested benefits, and you know they're going to be taken away when your income reaches a certain level, 
your incentive is maybe then to stay on those benefits and not to find work. That is not a good thing at all. That will just lead to an even greater strain on public finances and not the kind of incentives you want to be promoting in society. Even though you might be doing it for the right reasons as a government, the end outcomes might be quite uh, inefficient. And generally the impact on government finances is very strong. Take universal benefits for example. The more you increase or you implement universal benefits, the more that the government is having to spend, the greater the fiscal impact is of that. The government may simply not be able to afford it. In the future there might be significant um, uh, impacts of that. There might be significant uh, issues with that in terms of austerity policy. Min minimum maximum wages could be used by the government to directly impact labour markets and change wages there. So minimum wages above competitive outcomes. Why? To help those on lower wages, to help those who are getting wages which does not give them a decent standard of living. Minimum wages can artificially boost that wage and maybe access a greater living standard for those workers who are paid very lowly. We've considered minimum wages in a previous video. Watch that video for a more detailed understanding of them. But maximum wages, to control how much wages can increase beyond a certain level. Especially capping things like bonuses, for example, and that's becoming a big culture in the UK economy right now. Maximum wages control uh, how much wages can go beyond a certain level. They are a price uh, ceiling, if you think about it. They can't go beyond a certain level. But to question and to counter some of these policies, we can again question incentives. If there are maximum wages, what is the incentive to be entrepreneurial, to be productive, if your wage can't increase beyond a certain level? And for minimum wages, we can look at the employment side effects of it, as considered in my previous video, and especially the impact on the youth and how unemployment can target the youth when you impact and impose a minimum wage. Legislations can be used by governments, so let's look at some examples. Anti-discrimination laws can help reduce wage differentials. Uh, hiring and firing legislation, making it stricter, for example, and harder for firms to fire workers, to make workers redundant, can again help reduce the unequal nature of uh, income and wealth distribution. By imposing minimum wages, as we said, by uh, allowing more maternity and paternity leave, again, making outcomes fairer in labour markets. But the problem with legislations is how costly they can be for businesses. The enforcement of them needs to be strong if they're actually going to have an impact. But the significant risk of government failure, how businesses may shut down because of how costly these legislations might be. They may relocate to other countries where legislations aren't as strict. These are all unintended consequences of government um, policy here, of government intervention. And that can lead to a government failure, where the costs of intervention outweigh the benefits of intervention. The government may take a different view and try and help to reduce poverty or redistribute income and wealth by looking at supply-side policies, our classic supply-side policies like government spending on education and training, like government spending on healthcare, tackling issues at the root of the problem, a lack of productivity. So both of these policies help to improve productivity, spending on education and training by increasing skills, and that increase in skills should translate to higher MRP, higher productivity, and therefore higher incomes and higher wages. By spending more on healthcare, we again help to keep productivity high in the economy. If somebody falls sick, then they can get treated easy, they can keep their productivity high, they take less number of days out of work, which keeps productivity high and keeps their earning potential high. So the idea behind this is you tackle the root cause of poverty or the root cause of unequal distributions of income and wealth. And in the long term, you help to reduce that gap and improve situations. However, these policies are very, very expensive and maybe cannot necessarily be afforded by governments who are under very, very tough budgetary control at the moment, enacting austerity policies at the moment. And also, they take a long time to take an effect. So if you want a quick improvement in the distribution of income and wealth in reductions in poverty, these policies are not going to give it to you. They are long-term policies. Let's now look at some key evaluation points that will feature in essays where you want to talk about redistributing income and wealth. Well, two points here we've focused on throughout our discussion so far. The incentives impact and the state of government finances. You've always got to worry about the perverse incentives that some of these policies may promote. And a lot of these policies are costly. Whether the governments can actually afford them, given the state of government finances, you need to consider. So weighing these two points up is very good evaluation. This is very strong, considering equity against efficiency. 
It's hard to argue against any of these policies on the equity front, i.e. on the fairness front. These are all very fair policies, you might argue. But are they all efficient? Maybe not. Consider the distortion of incentives of a lot of these policies. Very inefficient in terms of what the end outcomes might be. But something like minimum and maximum wages, distorting efficient labour market outcomes, will lead to significant inefficiency depending on the level of the caps, depending on the level of the minimum wage, for example. So weighing up those arguments could be very strong evaluation. As I mentioned at the start of the video, government intervention in labour markets is a normative consideration. Is that really the best reason for intervening in the market? Is that going to lead to the best outcomes? You can argue not. If any time there is intervention based on normative judgments, the risk of inefficiency is even greater. You might you know, have the intention of making things better, but actually you might be making things worse. So if uh, the reason for intervention is purely normative, um, the end outcomes may be very much government failure. So we can link those two points together. Normative is not really an economist's, the best economist's argument for intervening in markets. And we need to consider whether the government needs to intervene in these markets. Is the level of inequality, is the gap uh, between the rich and the poor so big that it requires intervention? Or is the level of inequality out there in society okay, acceptable, just part of what capitalist economies will bring you? If that's your conclusion, then maybe the government doesn't need to intervene and risk the uh, potential of government failure, risk making things worse than what they are right now. So weighing up your government failure arguments, these very, very strong arguments, to your normative considerations, to whether inequality is bad enough, so bad that it requires intervention, to inefficiency arguments, is a strong way of evaluating throughout. That's it guys, very, very hearty content here questions that come up very, very regularly in your exams. Hopefully now you can smash it and you understand it. Thank you so much for watching now. Make sure you revise your notes in detail. I'll see you all in the next video.